Chapter 8. Dinosaur Brain. It turned out to be a cool summer. I figured we'd get in trouble for running into the pond. It looked bad for a while when the cops drove us home, and I got out all soaking wet and covered with gook. And when Grim was hosing me down, he had this really pruny look on his face like he was smelling something bad. But the cops made out like I was a hero or something, rescuing the poor crippled midget kid. So Grim listens to the cops, and then he gives me this weird look, like, imagine my surprise. And he goes in the house, and then Graham comes running out in her nightgown with this big fluffy towel, and she really makes a fuss. Me rescuing Freak. What a joke, right? Except that's how it must have looked from a distance, because they never knew it was Freak who rescued me, or his genius brain, and my big dumb body. Graham is there rubbing me with the towel, and her hands are shaking, and she's saying, Oh, I saw those blue lights, and I thought the worst. And Grim is behind her, looking at me real intense and shaking his head. And he's saying, Who'd have thunk it, Mabel? Which is some kind of joke, because Graham's name isn't Mabel. Anyhow, they take me inside, and the first thing Graham does is give me a bowl of ice cream. And Grim, he keeps shaking his head, and he goes, What this young man needs is a cup of coffee. Real coffee. And then he gets busy putting the filter in the machine and measuring out the coffee and standing by while it drips through. And he's got this stern look like he's thinking deep thoughts. By the time I polish off the ice cream, Graham is handing me coffee in a china cup from the set they never use. He gives me that cup like it's a really big deal, maybe because I'm not allowed to drink coffee yet. And he's so grim-like and serious, I open my mouth to say, what's the big deal? You really think this is my first cup of coffee? Yeah, right. And something happens, and the words come out, thank you, sir, and it's like I'm possessed or something. I've no idea where the things I'm saying are coming from or why. I go, thanks for the towel, Graham, and the ice cream. Could I have sugar in the coffee? Two teaspoons, please. And Grim claps his hands together, and he says, of course you can, son. And it's like, whoa, because he never calls me that. Always Max or Maxwell or that boy. Next thing, he's clearing his throat and coughing into his fist, and Graham is looking at the two of us, and she gets this Graham-like glow, like this is how it's supposed to be, the way things always happen in the wonder years, with the family getting all gooey and sentimental about some numb thing the bratty kid did while he's having all his wonderful years or whatever. Graham says, I want you to promise me something, Maxwell, dear. Promise me you'll keep away from the hoodlum boy and his awful friends. Nobody got hurt this time, but I shudder to think what might have happened. And Grim, bless his pointed little head, he goes, Maxwell can handle himself, can't you, Max? Right, uh, Max, not son, which is okay by me. I can run, I say to Graham. I see Tony D, that's what I'll do. Good boy, Graham says. I thought because you're so much bigger than he is, well, you just do that, dear. You run away. He's not running away, Grimm says, real impatient. He's taking evasive action, avoiding a confrontation. That's a very different thing, right, Max? I nod and drink my coffee without slurping and decide it's better not to mention that Tony D carries a knife, and he's probably got guns too, because then Graham would only worry, and she's such a clunker when she's worried. Like I said, it turns out to be a pretty cool summer. Usually what I do is just hang around and look at my comic books and watch the tube or go shopping with Graham if she really makes a fuss. I hate the beach because the beach is stupid. The cool crowd looking sleek and tanned and aren't we gorgeous? And because if you saw me lying on a blanket, you'd go, hey, why is that albino walrus wearing sunglasses? So mostly I just vegetate in the basement and pick my navel to quote Grimm, Mr. Belly Button Lint himself. Freak changes all that. Each and every morning, the little dude humps himself over, and he bangs on the bulkhead. Wonka, wonka, wonka. He may be small, but he sure is noisy. Get out of bed, you lazy beast. There are fair maidens to rescue, dragons to slay, which is what he says every single morning, exactly the same thing, until it's like he's this alarm clock, and as soon as I hear the wonka, wonka, wonka of him beating the bulkhead, I know what's coming next. Fair maidens and dragons, and freak with that wake-up-the-world grin of his going, Hurry up with the cereal. How can you eat that much, you big ox? Come on, let's do something. He's so full of ever-ready energy, you can practically hear his brain humming, and he never can sit still. Ants in the pants, I say one morning when he's ready to yank the cereal bowl off the table. He's in such a hurry to do something, and he goes, what? And I go, 
you must have ants in your pants. And he gets this funny look and he goes, that's what the fair Gwen always says. Did she tell you to say that? And I shake my head and finish the cereal real slow. And Freak goes, for your information, there are 2,247 known subspecies of hymenopteran insects, Latin name, Formicida, and none of them are in my pants. Which cracks me up, even though I don't understand a word he's saying. I propose a quest, he says. We shall journey far to the east and see what lies there. By now I know what a quest is because Freak has explained the whole deal, how it started with King Arthur trying to keep all his knights busy by making them do things that proved how strong and brave and smart they were, or sometimes how totally numb. Because how else can you explain dudes running around inside big clunky tin cans and praying all the time? Which I don't mention to Freak because he's very sensitive about knights and quests and secret meanings. Like how a dragon isn't really just a big slimy fire-breathing monster, it's a symbol of nature or something. A dragon is fear of the natural world, Freak says, an archetype of the unknown. I go, what's an archetype? And Freak sighs and shakes his head and reaches into his knapsack for his dictionary. This is true. He really does keep a dictionary in his knapsack. It's his favorite book, and he pulls it out like Arnold Schwarzenegger pulling out a machine gun or something. That's the fierce look he gets with a book in his hands. Go on, he says, making me take the book. Look it up. And now I wish I hadn't said anything about this archetype dude, because I hate looking up stuff in his stupid dictionary. Start with A, he says. I know that. A-R, he says. Just go along the A's until you come to A-R. Yeah, right. Easy for a genius to use a dictionary, since he already knows how to spell the words. And R's never look like backwards E's to freak, which is the way they look to me sometimes, unless I really squint and think about it. Careful, he says, you'll bite off your tongue, and then we'll have to waste the day at the emergency room getting it reattached. Microsurgery is such a bore. Didn't anybody ever tell you that? Huh? I say, but I do close my mouth, so my tongue doesn't stick out. I'm still looking in the dictionary for archetype, and I'm looking for words that are underlined with red ink, because that's what Freak does the first time he looks up a word. He makes a line under it, and you'd be amazed how many are underlined. There are whole pages like that, where he's looked up every single word. Finally, he spells out all the letters for me, and I find the stupid word. There's nothing about dragons here, I say, squinting hard at the stuff under the word. It just says pattern. So what is it, a sewing type of thing? Freak has this disgusted look, and he takes the dictionary, and he goes, You're hopeless. Pattern is the first definition. I was referring to the second definition, which is much more interesting. A universal symbol or idea in the psyche expressed in dreams or dreamlike images. Like that helps, right? I'm getting bored with the dictionary, so I pretend to understand. And Freak finally gives up, and he shakes his head and goes, I don't know why I bother. Dinosaurs had brains the size of peanuts, and they ruled the earth for a hundred million years.